Je donne la parole à Madame Nathalie de la Palme, qui est directrice exécutive de la Fondation Mo Ibrahim. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I will focus, if you allow me, on the COVID crisis, which you mentioned in your introduction, and its specific impact in Africa some 18 months ahead. First, to say that we can't consider, at least in Africa, that we have entered post-COVID times. At health level, there is undoubtedly a later impact, until now milder, but rising concerns ahead. At economic and social impact, it's worse than in other regions. But on the other hand, it's probably the huge opportunity. J'ai oublié, il faut appuyer, voilà. Oui, quand vous prenez la parole, s'il vous plaît, appuyez sur le bouton, parce que quand vous appuyez, tout est enregistré. Quand vous appuyez, le micro vient vers vous et la caméra aussi. Merci. Do you, do you hear me? Ah, yes, it's much better. <laughs> Sorry about that. Apologies. But on the other hand, so health, later impact, milder until now, but rising concerns ahead. Economic and social level, worse than in mo most regions. So definitely, we haven't entered post-COVID in Africa. On the other hand, it's probably a huge opportunity to review the current model. If we take health first, there is a later and deeper impact than expected. Now, why later and why deeper? Later, because we have indeed have an impressive, decisive, immediate action by Africa CDC, instructed by Ebola, and supported by strong leadership, and it's important to note that, both at EU level, African Union, and in many governments. Indeed, most countries in Africa have deployed some of the fastest travel bans globally, quickly rolled out tracing capacities and put in place restricting, restrictive sorry, lockdown measure. Many have done a poten seen a potential correlation with the youth majority and a possible immunity induced by malaria coverage. Climate, no, but research is looking at that. Indeed, the first wave has appeared relatively late and remained initially milder than in any other regions. But maybe this was just another case of Africa lagging behind. And now, while most regions at global level are on their fourth, fourth wave, uh, sorry, while, while most regions seem on the road to recovery, many African countries are already on their fourth wave with a speed rate that is taking more and more um, speed. If we take the numbers, exactly four months ago, on the 1st of May, we had a little bit more than 4.56 million recorded cases. Exactly four months now, on the 1st of October, we have 8.32, which is a rise of more than 80% a rise that more than 80% over the last four months. Plus, if we are frank, we only know of data as recorded, and we need to remain cautious here because we all know the weakness of African data. Just one, one fact, only four countries out of 54 have a decent death registration system. Now, why deeper? because it has led bare the already fragile health systems in Africa. If we take human resources, for example, one out of four African-born physicians are currently working in high-income countries. In sub-Saharan Africa, you have less than two physicians for 10,000 people compared to 34 in Europe. Infrastructure and logistics then, including access to reliable energy and water, clean water. In, in Sub-Saharan Africa, on average, you have 135 hospital beds for 100,000 people. We have 40 countries without one ventilator per country, and only a quarter 
of health facilities in sub-Saharan Africa have access to reliable electricity. The second point is that COVID impact at health level has seen, has led to an upsurge of other, often stronger killers, HIV, malaria, TB, due to the eviction effect uh, led by COVID. And most probably, current studies are now assessing that we could come back when it comes to TB to the level of 10 years ago. So this is really a matter for concern. Now, this weakness is, can be linked to insufficient domestic commitment up to now. In 2018, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan African countries spent less than 2% of their GDP on public health, which is the second lowest level uh, at global level, and which is probably linked to an over-reliance on donors' help, be it multilateral institutions, bilateral partners, or foundations. And then last but not least, the current scandal of vaccine inequity, we have talked about it a lot over the last two days, but we need to remember that Africa represents almost 20% of the world's population, but only less than 3% of the current vaccinated people. And this is a matter of concern specifically for the frontline health worker. Now, if we look at the economic and social landscape, we have here a very heavy impact, more so than in any other region. At economic level, this is a heavy blow with a kind of double confinement effect. We could say double pain. First, because the African populations were confined in their own country, because also because Africa has been confined from the rest of the world or by the rest of the world. And indeed, when you look at figures, there again, Africa has hit recession for the first time in 25 years, minus, almost minus 2% at continental level in 2020. Even if, as a Lionel Zazu underlined yesterday, some countries have continued to grow. We, you had 20, 12 countries in 2020 that grow. And even if indeed in 2021, the growth projected almost 5% is higher than what was initially projected. However, we are still falling short by in 2021, 150 billion of the pre-pandemic projections. Secondly, the recovery is going to be slower, falling short year two of pre-pandemic projection until 2024, with the current loss over the year 2019-2024 estimated at 850 billion by recent IMF projection. Some countries in Africa may take at least seven years to recover their pre-pandemic level. So one point here to underline is the growing inequality on the continent between Af countries. I'm underlining this because this growing inequality is a matter for concern and a recipe for instability. Now here again why? We have the same factor somehow, which is an excessive dependency on external demand, which completely collapsed for a while, be it in commodities or in tourism, which, which was a growing business in Africa over the last 10 years. Social, what do, we have, what do we see at social level? A very heavy impact there too, leading there too to growing inequalities, this time within the countries. What do we see? At education, we see, we have seen everywhere in the world, children out of school. 20 in week, 28 weeks in average, which is roughly the global average. The big difference in Africa is the lack of remote learning tools. So these children out of school, they have lost one year of education. And there has been a particular impact for the girls because the studies have shown that many of these out-of-school girls got pregnant 
and we'll never go back to school. So it's, it's something that needs to be watched. We have seen also, we are seeing gender issue with growing violence against women. We see poverty issue with a growing number of poor. Probably a projection made by assessment made, made by UNICA, 40% of total population of the continent in 2021 will be in a situation of extreme poverty. Food insecurity. The COVID crisis had, has arrived on top of probably one of the worst locust plague over the last 70 years. So this has worsened the situation. The situation itself has been worsened by the lockdown effects where quite a lot of people were unable to go and buy food or unable to go and farm whatever they had to farm. And as for health products, we also see here an excessive reliance on imported products when it comes to food. 80% of food products are imported out of Africa, 95% for health products. Civic and democratic space, I won't be long here because I'm sure that uh, other will have much more to say than, than me, but we have seen excessive and unjustified restriction, both in civic and democratic space, that are a matter for concern. Now, this was, uh, this deterioration was already there pre-COVID, as you mentioned, Mr. President, but undoubtedly, the COVID situation has often definitely worsened it, and I very often served as pretext to, to worsen this, uh, this situation. On top of that, as you know, most African countries didn't have the fiscal space that allowed them to put in place mitigation plans to you know, help the economic and social impact of COVID. When you consider, for example, that most fiscal uh, resources uh, come from customs, the, the loss uh, assessed from COVID is something more than 35% of the fiscal resources for 2020. And last but not least, a very complex and complexifying, if I may say so, debt burden with China being now the largest single bilateral creditor. And when I'm saying China, it's multiple Chinese creditors, which makes the solving of it quite complicated. Now, all these rather stark assessment of facts must not lead to a gloomy conclusion. And in fact, on the contrary, there is a silver lining to this very heavy current crisis. But by laying bare the current vulnerabilities or deficiencies that were mentioned by President Kagame himself yesterday, of most African current economic and social models, basically with an excessive dependency on both external demand and external supply, this general crisis has been a wake-up call. So if, if just to replicate a very much used quote, never let a good crisis go to waste. And we all know that there is no deep change if it's not triggered by a very heavy crisis. People otherwise don't see the need or the interest to change anything in the way they are doing business. Let me just take the example of vaccines. All of a sudden, health has changed its status when it comes to public policies from something that was up to now basically left to donors to something that has become a matter of domestic security and to the need to ensure what's now called health sovereignty. And this is a very important change. First, what happened was the wish and even the request si, to si be able peut, madame, to buy. Vous pris plus, plus du double du temps déjà. Uh, no. Sorry. Vous avez pris plus du double ah, du pardon. temps. On avait dit sept minutes. Ah, pardon. Plus, vous avez appris plus de, plus, de, plus de 16 minutes déjà. OK. Concluez pour qu'on avance. Merci. Pardon. 
sorry, so the, the, the wish and the request to be able to buy the needed vaccine, and when it happened, it was impossible because of the hoarding from other countries, the need and the commitment to, to build quickly a stronger vaccine manufacturing capacity. Making the case, making a business case of it. There is a market for this vaccine manufacturing capacity and it will create local employment. So to conclude here, two points that are linked back to all the discussions we've had over the last two days. The first one is the obvious interconnection of Africa's situation at global level, be it about health, economy of security, if Africa continues to remain until this vaccination level, it will become an incubator for other variants. Economy, if recovery doesn't pick up, there is no way the continent has the means for any green recovery. And last but not least, security and stability. You mentioned terrorism. And uh, Madame uh, le Premier Ministre, you said yesterday 70% of the population under 35. But if the young people continue to see shrinking process, prospects, we are paving the way for more uncontrolled migration, more attractivity of terrorist and criminal networks, more social unrest and more conflict. The second point is that in this completely changed landscape, there is a reinforced move towards new partnership, new geostrategic alliances and balances with the Russia, China, India, Turkey, Gulf states coming in on the African continent uh, to make the best of this new landscape. Thank you and apologies for...